For our next speaker, we have Sophia Marlsen. Sophia is an, I'm not quite sure how to say this, Arc Decra Fellow. And <laughs> I thought I should bring it all in. Okay, great. Uh, senior le and senior lecturer in the School of Architecture, Design and Planning at the University of Sydney. Prior to joining the University of Sydney, Sophia was a postdoctoral researcher. at the EU-funded project Programmable Cities. And now she is currently researching how the translation of computational logics and technologies is being applied to hack housing and address issues of housing affordability and innovation, as well as looking at the potential role of technologies in tenant advocacy. Her research is predominantly situated at the intersection of the digital and material across urban space and governance, housing and feminism, with particular interest in the digital media uh, mediation and reconfiguration of relationships across these spaces. For this conference, we were particularly inspired by Sophia's work on feminist approaches to the digital in relation to the smart home and smart housing. The smart city and the crisis of housing affordability is reconfiguring the home and very interestingly, Sophia is introducing this notion of hacking into this question. So, for your talk, the title <laughs> is Hacking as a minor approach that prefigures future cities and feminist approaches beyond the he hegemony of the smart city. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you for Thank the lovely you. welcome. Such a pleasure to be here. Uh, like many people, this is my first in-person uh, in conference since the pandemic. Um, so it's very exciting. But before I begin, I'd also like to acknowledge uh, the tradition of custodianship and law of the country on which the University of Sydney campuses stand and also the land where I live and do most of my work, which is Gadigal country. And I pay uh, my respects to those who have cared and continued to care for country. Um, and uh, you know, you can't really talk about housing in Australia without talking about um, basically a colonialized land, land that was taken. Anyway, that's another, that's for another time. But um, so it's not controversial to bring attention to the flaws inherent to the smart city. Indeed, many of those who've deeply done so and whose work I admire are here today. And I wish that I was able to level sort of the, the insightful level of Marxist critique um, that calls out the neoliberal and capitalist alliances of the ways that many smart cities have emerged and are managed and discuss their compliance with rentier, data and platform capitalism on a level that requires an intimate relationship with political economic thinking, uh, much more deeper uh, than the level that I, um, I have. Similarly, I wish I'd produced work on data and feminism like uh, Lauren's work here, um, an amazingly hard act to follow, but they're not my strengths, so I'm going to work with what I have. And I'm going to summarise these as bitching, glitching and caring. I do love a good bitch, so, you know, bear with me again. So first of all, what I have is, wait for it, a feeling. So those who are uncomfortable with feelings uh, can tune out now. Um, but my first feeling is one of discomfort. And it's discomfort with the major theory's inability to account for experiences beyond the system level. So, for example, and I'm going to be talking about housing, um, while major theories do important work explaining the form of the housing system, they're less adept at understanding the everyday experience of a changing housing landscape. And it's this everyday experience that I'm particularly interested in. And this discomfort also arises, if I'm being really honest, uh, from sense of exclusion from the Marx Bro Club, uh, Marx Bro Boys Club, and you know, not all Marx Bros. Some of them are my best friends, but um, I would like to join you. So, if there's a if there's a special club word, please let me know. But my second feeling, and I only have two, I'm not that emotionally complex, is one of dissatisfaction and frustration with the inability of governments and regulators to listen to act on systemic issues. Thank you, Major Theories, for calling them out. But also the fact that despite all the work that we do on calling them out, the revolution isn't coming. And connected to this, the sort of often dismissal that minor incursions that don't actually overthrow the system, but enact some sort of change are somehow not as worthy. Now, I know I'm not the first person to feel this way. My use of minor theory is obviously a clear reference to Cindy Cutts and her critique of some of the academic big boys, work which also aligns with micro-political analyses. 
And there's a long trajectory with feminist work that draws the attention to these micro-political entanglements. Um, uh, the everyday intersectional experiences and ruptures. So Agnieszka Lichensky, for example, has used Legacy Russell's glitch feminism uh, to recast glitchy urban platforms as a potential way to engage with more hopeful platform politics. Glitch feminism acknowledges the simultaneous ability for error and erratum in digitally mediated formations. So essentially, each rupture offers an opportunity to correct for a different and better outcome. Similarly, I propose the hack. The hack is a workaround that arises in response to flaws in the existing system as a conceptual framework for thinking through the urban. And I'll elaborate on that here today. The idea being that a hack as a workaround to a problem is a prefigurative politics for an alternative smart city future. I just remembered I forgot to put on my reference there. So in focusing on this, I'm not saying that we should disregard major theories and the important work that they do, but that we should consider perhaps a, a more than political economy approach that can add nuance to understanding the growing diversity and agility and informality that we see in our cities. I'm an eternal fence sitter. As my high school English teacher, Miss Scott told me, I'd get a sore bottom if I didn't move from the fence and just needed to choose a side. Uh, so I'm wanting to hang on to elements of uh, both the major and the minor here, a medium theory and in between. Now for the purposes of this paper, I will be focusing on hacking housing. And this may seem an odd fit for a conference that's particularly dwelling on the idea of smart cities. But as I've argued previously, we can see smart housing situated in the context of changing housing markets, new sharing economies and smart city debates. For example, housing disruptors such as Airbnb have created dramatic shifts in rental markets of many cities, displacing residents and exacerbating a housing affordability crisis that is intimately entangled with declining home ownership and the precarity and mobility of labour markets and gig economies. The same platforms that underpin the smart city are reconfiguring housing. Just as Uber promises on-demand rides, certain startups are promising to provide housing on demand or to match us with a house or a flatmate. So using the example of housing, I want to demonstrate how small scale and perhaps even minor interventions, hacks if you will, can be politicized to enact a prefigurative politics. Uh, that can speak to more than political economy assertions and outcomes and enable an infrastructure of care. I want to articulate these links between hacks and conceptualising housing as an infrastructure of care, something which has been wonderfully detailed by Emma Power and Kathy Mee's work, Kathy Mee's work grounded in that, of course, of Fisher and Tronto's feminist ethics of care work. So there are clear limitations with the idea of the housing hack. Approaching its politics can be messy, when presenting it as neither inherently good nor bad, but rather as something in which outcomes are driven by the politics of the hack um, that's actually enacted. So a core critique is to consider the co-optable nature of hacks, so their capacity to perpetuate the neoliberalisation of housing um, and their assumed relative inability to enact real system change. So I don't dismiss these concerns and I do hold them myself. But the political project of working towards more equitable housing systems must continue. But there's also a politics of the minor. Relying solely on established hegemonic political economic critiques, as Sarah Barnes notes, only takes us so far and does little to further our thinking about housing and alternative housing futures. It also does little to take seriously the experiences of those who can't afford to wait for the housing system to be fixed and who are responding to current constraints in diverse ways, um, the sort of in the meantime responses. And it also obscures the opportunity to take seriously some of the generative outcomes to come from the hacks. And I'll preface that a lot of the work that I'm talking about is in Australia's housing system. And we have a very, uh, uh, let's say, very limited diversity in our housing system. So some of the things that I might talk about as innovative um, in housing might just be every day, everywhere else. But anyway, we'll go with that. So what do I mean by hacking? So put simply, the hack is an appropriate application of ingenuity. 
hacks emerge as disruptions or breaches of the system or as simple workarounds. Urban hacks can be described as disruptors, as illustrated by the systemic changes to traditional systems of service provision, often through entrepreneurial digital innovations such as Uber and Airbnb, hacks of transport and housing provision. Digital technologies accelerate this, with digital disruption emerging as rapidly unfolding processes through which digital innovation comes to fundamentally alter historically sustainable logics for value creation and capture by unbundling and rec recombining linkages among resources or generating new ones. So digital or not, the logics of the hack remain the same. Hacking is part of the broader translation of computational logics to the city that characterise smart and innovative city approaches. So the idea of the uh, city spaces as programmable illustrates the ways in which computational logics are performed across material cultural situations even at the level of speculative designs or imaginings of political processes, as Gabriel tells us. Similar to that of Zuck and Graham, my concern here is to emphasise the ethos and organisation rather than the technology of hacking. The logics, processes and practices of hacking as part of the broader translation of these computational thinking ways of thinking to the city, uh, which are framed as a response to existing urban challenges. So hacking the urban can be done digitally or materially um, or as a hybrid of the two. Hacking is also a form of labour, both thinking and doing, and it's primarily located in network society. So Himenen sees hacking as the work of ethic underpinning the information society in which creativity is highly prized, while Mackenzie Walk, situating herself as a crypto-Marxist, sees hackers as the revolutionary class of the society in which information is the third stage in property relations. So this tension between Weberian and Marxist framing of hacking emerges in the context of housing, in debates around whether hacking um, is an act of resistance or a form of neoliberal co-option. So that is, whether a hack is offering a politically and socially viable alternative, such as, for example, a housing cooperative, or whether it is a form of roll-with-it neoliberalism, to borrow from Tonkis, an example being Airbnb. Both cooperatives and Airbnb are about shared resources, but one is intentionally community-focused, and sometimes, although not always, it meets affordable housing needs, and the other um, is firmly neoliberal. Um, so obviously the cooperative uh, model is far more in line with uh, a caring infrastructure. But how do we know if we've been hacked? Well, the first place to start is to look where things and systems are beginning to behave in a different way than usual. The glitches, the disruptions. And if we look carefully, these changes are happening at a place where there is a problem already lurking. So it's important to note that the hack emerges as a response to these problems and causes the changes. It isn't the actual source of the problem itself. As Gunkel notes, hackers do not in any strict sense of the term cause the disruptions or general system failures exhibited in and by the activities of hacking. Hacking only fixates on and manipulates an aporia, bug and or backdoor that is always and already present within and constitutive of the system itself. So hacking isn't some catastrophe that befalls an innocent and pure system as a kind of external threat or pro and profound danger. It develops from a necessary and unaffordab unavoidable deformity that always and already resides within and defines the proper formation of the system itself. So for example, we're going to see a range of housing hacks emerge, um, or sorry, we are seeing a range of housing hacks emerge. Some of these are formalised, some are informal and some are illegal. In response, and these are all in response to failures in the provision of housing. In some cities, housing affordability problems are being reframed and worked around in policy contexts through iterative experiments with policy and housing models. Responding to housing market pressures, more local governments are experimenting with different ways of thinking about the housing problem, trialling modifications to regulations, proposing different financing mechanisms, and even experimenting with different dwelling forms and locations. So this is making it easier to increase the diversity of housing through regulatory mechanisms as another way um, that we can say that housing is being hacked. So for example, the Boston Housing Innovation Lab, an office within the city of S Boston's Department of Neighbourhood Development, illustrates what happens when hacking is a way of thinking 
uh, thinking about and doing as applied to local housing challenges. Faced with increased housing affordability, uh, unaffordability and a missing middle of housing, the iLab seeks to resolve these issues by testing innovative housing models and accelerating the pace of innovation in the housing sector. The iLab has labelled its method as a prototype prototype driven approach to iteratively experiment with housing policy uh, regulations and provisions and this has resulted in proposing out-of-the-box solutions to think through such as facilitating intergener intergenerational home share um, also to try and address social isolation experimenting with the plug-in house which level which leverages new technologies and construction methods to supply housing on infill sites previously thought unbuildable and the urban housing unit which showcase the potential of compact living to generate feedback on the role smaller dwellings could play in the city's housing landscape so here housing is being hacked by proactively encouraging housing innovation collaboration and partnership in addressing housing as part of a broader socio-economic ecosystem. The hackers in these cases include government officers and city service providers, architects, designers, citizens and residents. There is a commitment by municipal governments to support these changes through governance mechanisms. Sim simultaneously, hacking is redefining the problem of housing affordability and finding new ways to live in the context of unaffordable housing markets that have put pressure on traditional housing pathways. So the need to reframe the problem and to find different solutions is itself driven by a failure of existing systems. Political economy is productive in exposing the structural dynamics and the issues with the housing system. Um, so big thanks to them. However, it's use less useful in working in minor ways to imagine, test and understand small interventions and counter narratives on the ground. With limited ability to overhaul the current structural conditions of the housing system, hacks as a minor approach allow people to work with what is immediately available to find alternative ways of meeting needs. So the hack is useful in that it directs us to where problems exist, the spaces in between. In housing, emergent hacks respond to growing problems of affordability and security, as well as responding to broader economic transitions, including growing unemployment, precarity and mobility. For example, the rise in co-living developments and on-demand housing is a response to the lack of affordable rental housing, high levels of mobility associated with precarious labour, inflexible lease periods and conditions associated with traditional leases and the barriers encountered when needing to, to quickly find housing in new cities. As Vesley Riley observes, the rise of co-living was not to fill the void left by, say, the decline of religion, as We Live's co-founder Miguel McKelvey once implied. Instead, it filled the void left by the decline of boarding houses, turn of the century single-sex residency hotels and SROs. So hacks like co-living offer counter options in areas where traditional service provision is falling, uh, is, sorry, is failing. And in this case, the provision of housing and associated changes in labour markets. So the hack can show us what's not working in the housing system and point to the actors and the practices that are responding to these flaws. Some of which may be outside traditional housing systems and processes. Indeed, they may be outside major theoretical interventions. Within housing, hacks point to alternative ways of organising the housing system, from different ways of designing and building housing to alternative modes of governance or ways of organising markets. So returning to the example of the growth of co-living, um, for example, we are able to use a hack uh, to analyse why co-living is emerging as a new way of providing and living, with, um, living within housing, but also to see what value, if any, co-living offers as a solution to existing housing problems. So we can see, for example, that co-living developments are a more bougie form of boarding house, repackaged in social media friendly forms, sharply designed with programmed uh, events such as movie nights or yoga, which sounds like my idea of hell. Uh, they offer both community and flexible accommodation options suitable to those who are on the move. So digital nomads or the precarious workers of the new creative class, as Tegan Bergen refers to them as. However, they do so at a relatively premium price. So Grunst, 
Grundström, apologies if I've said that name incorrectly, reflects on this mobility as an asset um, on the housing market in the rise of boutique shared housing developments in Sweden, uh, which provides an alternative housing options for singles who are highly mobile and also affluent. So it's at this intersection of wealth and nobility and mobility as it materialises um, in Grundström's example is at risk of producing shared housing that's an echelon of exclusivity based on mobility. So such developments are exclusionary, generally not what we would consider affordable and are definitely not a long-term housing solution. However, they do also feel a need that's not being met by the housing market. And so they're embedded in these everyday experiences um, and a need to meet certain immediate housing needs. However, the negative outcomes of some hacks do not mean that we should uh, discard the contributions that hacks can make. Indeed, housing hacks can be effective if they're politicised. So as Madden and McCoo's note, there are valuable lessons to be gained from experimenting with the construction and provision of housing drawing our attention to already existing forms of, alt um, of alternative tenure, neighbourhood organisation and building techniques, Madden and Makus argue that extant diversity can help us to imagine and develop new forms of housing. Cooperatives, community land trusts and co-housing are examples of the creative and communal antidote to residential attention that Madden and Makus highlight, although they note the possibility of and caution against the recommodification of these options. So the hack's ability to reveal and value alternative opportunities for housing points to the third element of the hack, and that is its use as a speculative tool. And as such, it can extend from the already existing alternative forms of housing to the possible not yet imagined housing futures. And if we recognise housing as a socio-material system that patterns the possibility of care, then the hack can help us conceive of these possibilities. And that brings me to caring. As Temenos notes, Katz's major, uh, sorry, minor theory emphasises ways of working within the in-between spaces of major theory to investigate a different way of working with material. So the hack, when used as a speculative method, has similar tendencies. Hacking provides a way to experiment, prototype, iterate and play with solutions within existing constraints and is often iterative in nature. It's a creative method that assembles and repurposes existing forms of agency. And then it's in this making, this assembling and repurposing that speculative futures become legible and lend hacking a possible prefigurative politics towards more caring infrastructures. So I'm going to talk about an example um, here, which is Jasmine Grove, a retirement village in Wollongong, south of Sydney. Um, and it's just one sort of very small example of what could be possible. So I came across Jasmine Grove um, with some work that I was doing on older people share housing, um, in particular women share housing. Um, these women were share housing because it was the only thing they could afford, the next sort of step up beyond sleeping on couches and in cars. And some of them were sharing for the first time in their life in their 70s and 80s. So in Australia, older women are our fastest growing group at risk of homelessness due to intersections of income discrepancies, retirement and housing policy. Housing for older people might not be sexy, but with a growing ageing population intersecting with a housing crisis, it's increasingly important. And alongside this increase in people 65 and over share housing, the aged housing sector has realised that many people increasingly actually can't afford their traditional um, housing offerings and are beginning to experiment with new models. So hacks, if you will, of their system. Jasmine Grove is one of the first experiments of this kind in Australia. Run by IRT, they have a traditional retirement living options, but have realised that you know, the unique challenges and housing needs facing women over 55 and an increasing number of people can't afford their offerings. They also want something smaller and they crave more connection, as the developer observes. We've been listening to women and working with them in lots of different projects and we've heard that they wanted something different when they look for a home when they're retiring. They're looking for affordability, looking for social connection and intentional design to help that social connection happen. And that's why we've built, and it's the first of our kind in Australia to our knowledge, 
a co-housing retirement village for women over 55 who are living on their own. The key thing is that we're looking to build a really happy and well-functioning community, not simply just building. Where I suppose facilitating that whole process is to give the best chance of working and creating a better life for these women. So driven largely by one team, they did sort of a lot of background research, um, they identified their market, they are still a business after all, and they managed to leverage a small government grant from the Better Building Regions Fund. But they also needed support from their board to trial this different way of doing housing. And so the board, being cautious but interested, have given them permission to start small and scale if possible. So. You know, we're building a village with around 90 villas and Jasmine Grove will be just eight of those. It's still a risk, but you could say uh, we're stepping out, we're doing something small. And yeah, if we can make this successful, then we could continue and replicate it in other areas. Um, but it's really that process of testing. So uh, in a kind of, I guess, more increasingly mainstream approach um, to these kind of developments and of what many of you would be familiar with now, the team uh, co-designed with a group of women in a process that took around about a year. Um, as you can see here, they started working with women in terms of drawing on a piece of blank paper. What's your ideal home? So completely from scratch, you know, dream big. Don't let anything hold you back. And then we actually did some pieces like a jigsaw puzzle Here's some cut out pictures of some villas. Here's some green space. Here's a car park. Just sort of, sort of components of what a collaborative housing um, development could look like. And we asked them to cut it up in scissors, put little magnets in the back and rearrange them into a design on the whiteboard and something that you'd want to live in. So the resulting models were designed for affordability and connection and the ability to age in place. Um, and this was enabled through universal design um, and the structural requirements to retrofit with rails and hoists when needed. Agency was also important. As the developer noted, older people don't like the feeling of people doing everything for them and doing things to them. So it's an indictment of Australia's housing system and our retirement options that this co-housing development is a new and innovative um, model. But it is existing at the ex intersection of hacking and housing as an infrastructure of care. The last three decades of retirement and housing policy, mixed with the gender pay gap and structural disadvantage, have created the perfect environment for housing hacking, for hacking house, this housing hack for older women. This is, of course, not a perfect solution, um, and it's only eight units. But if successful, it can be scaled up and adds much needed diversity to our housing system. The development is based in the everyday needs and social relations of individual women rather than significantly addressing the larger systemic drivers. But it does offer the opportunity to begin to ask critical questions that Emma Power and Kathy Mee argue we should ask of how care informs the housing system and the way that care flows intentionally and unintentionally through housing materialities, markets and governments. Jasmine Grove may be a small scale hack but it is one which envisions and materialises a more careful housing future. So the value of the hack and its ability to catalyse change is not an original thought. There are echoes here of Lefebvre's questioning whether experimental appropriation of urban space could translate to radical change. Hacks are also not necessarily long-term solutions and they may individually lack the ability to produce structural change. But importantly, they offer a direct response to immediate housing needs. So we need to remember that hacking takes place within existing constraints and therefore is, there's only so much they can actually do. But at the same time, it's also really easy to critique them as having this limited impact on housing inequality because of their relatively small scale piecemeal nature and capacity to being co-opted by and at times complicit with existing neoliberal housing systems. So at times they may appear as performative mechanisms that play lip service to housing problems, but do little in practice. But to ignore them, the imaginaries and the opportunities they can create is unhelpful, blinkered, and disregards their political potential. So, as Cindy Cutts notes of Deleuze and Guattari, the major and the minor are not different languages, but different uses or treatments of the language. With both cities and housing, the major and the minor are after the same thing, 
more affordable and suitable housing, better cities, essentially this infrastructure of care. But they're approaching it in different ways. Um, and thankfully for me, this allows me to remain sitting on the fence because she's like, yeah, you can have the major and you can have the minor. And I feel really comfortable with that. So in presenting the hack as a minor theory for understanding housing, I'm suggesting that we may be open to alternatives that both fulfill an immediate need and further that being open to these alternatives could prefigure a different and possibly more equitable caring housing future. Of course, we need to bring a critical approach to housing alternatives that the hack reveals to us. Looking at hackable interventions does not mean that we should stop producing research that continues to show the proven ways to address the housing problem. I mean, let's invest more in social housing and definancialize housing. Nor am I saying that we should relinquish, at, l relinquish our advocacy work. But maybe, just maybe, hacks can give us a glimpse of something different and better. While the examples I have given have illustrated the hacking work of city governance, governments such as policy prototyping and housing challenges and have identified emerging private sector responses to housing needs through co-living and platforms, hacking housing is a broad practice involving a diversity of actors and interests. For example, we can find a long history of hacking housing in squats and cooperatives, shared living and informal housing, those we traditionally as associate with more careful infrastructures. So conceptually, the hack allows us to think about housing in a way more attuned to the diversity and agility of the current housing system. Approached through the minor, it allows us to understand where the needs or desires are not being met um, and how these are driving solutions based in the now. And while these solutions may not be optimal from a major lens, the hacks allow us to see how these are generated through experience and need in ways in which the major cannot. As an analytical tool, the attention to other experiences the hack allows can help us identify those activities and actors that are actively shaping the housing landscape, but of which are outside of traditional systems. In doing so, the hack can illuminate challenges, opportunities and constraints. And as a speculative tool, the hack allows us to both imagine and materialise housing futures, both desirable and undesirable. And this is especially true when hacking is used as a method, uh, my lips is coming out as a method, including experimenting, prototyping and iterating different ways of doing housing. There is another urgent reason that we need to take the hack seriously. Hacks in other areas have shown the threat of disruptive interventions when they're not given enough thought, leaving governments on the regulatory back foot and exacerbating precarity. Disruptive predecessors such as Uber, Deliveroo and Airbnb all illustrate what happens when hacks are deployed in contexts where governments, regulatory institutions and citizens aren't ready or choose not to place checks on them. So it's important to take seriously the effects of hacks because what might seem like a small scale practice can rapidly scale to reconfigure cities, industries and economies. We might not like the hack and we can point to all its flaws, but there's danger in dismissing it. So one way of avoiding this danger of dismissal is paying attention to the politics of the hack. As Kurt Iveson has noted, the value, there is value in finding ways to politicise small-scale urban DIY interventions to democratise the city. The same sentiment can work within the housing hack and being careful that our hacking is attuned with care rather than harm. A better understanding of who is doing the hacking and who the hack is working for is a step in this direction. So in the examples that I've used, most of the people who are involved in hacks are those who are already interested in the housing system, governments, developers and activists. So does this perpetuate the same power relationships that exist now? And how can we make it more diverse and inclusions? Oh, one paragraph, is that okay? Thank you. So I'm gonna conclude with the following provocation and one which will you know, actually force me to get off the fence. Uh, yay, Miss Scott. And that is that a streak of anarchy can be traced in the history of the hack. The open source software copyleft movement materialized in Stallman's general public license was a radical challenge to private intellectual property. So rather than retaining individual proprietary under a GPL, a programmer remains the author of the software but relinquishes control of the program so it can be shared, modified and freely circulated. There is potential in this anarchistic streak to reinvigorate housing and it's been effective in the past, particularly with the squatters movement in the 70s. And this provocation for the housing hack lies in rethinking property rights that we see in the open source movement. 
both to ins and squatting to both inspire new models of design and provision um, and ownership. So could the way that we think about housing be reconfigured to the practices of sharing, modification, circulation and decentralisation that are seen in open source communities and an open source housing approach? By hacking, could we bitch, glitch and care our way to a better future city and housing system? Thank you. Thank you.